Wasteland 3 is a game I got for free from these guys that this guy worked on. He also did the job on this game. What does an executive producer do on a game? I have no idea, and I used to work in the industry. Let me see if I can get this right. Oh, beautiful. Wasteland 3 is a sequel to a game or spacious sky. that's a sequel to a really old game or amber waves of gray. And then that game had a baby, and they named it Fallout. I renamed it to Jacobstown after or an old friend died a long time ago. So is it any good? <laughs> I don't know. Let's find out. Oh, Rangers. I get the feeling this isn't a social call. The character builder allows for customization and weird synergies. Oftentimes in RPGs, I'll struggle with restarts, trying to find the build that I'm happy with, but not here. Combat is a great teacher, and I found myself learning what each character needed to improve by seeing what they lacked currently. Each ability score increase has tangible benefits on the battlefield, and just because you changed your mind about how you wanted your character to be built doesn't mean the character's useless, because the level cap is very high, so there's a larger margin of error. When your character's on the right track, it's the difference between a useless character and a character that can clear the battlefield by themselves. For instance, a high crit chance submachine gun build can literally saw through swaths of enemies. And with certain perks, you can get free attacks that chain with regular attacks that will grant more AP on kills. It gets crazy. A good submachine gun build can kill three enemies in one surprise round. There are snipers that focus on ambush shots that chain after every kill to ambush again and again as long as their brain sacks explode into red mist. You'll get plenty of chances to create the perfect character too because you don't just create one main character but four. I love when games allow me to do this because I grew to love my rangers. I actually felt joy when they landed a crit or mowed through a group of enemies or got some cool new piece of gear. I was proud of this group of badasses that I had made. Combat's the burn of what you'll be doing in the game, and it has two different designs. Random encounters, which have a sort of vertical flow, where you're slowly killing from the inside of a funnel, striking outward from the middle, and slowly clearing threats to the corners of the map. While most of the story encounters seem to favor preparation, stealth, and sneak attacks to take out dangerous enemies, or walking into a room to disable the defenses, and firing off a sniping round into the CPU of a particularly difficult robot, and having it attack its friends. The encounter design allows for players to experiment using choke points, and you can use molotovs or chemical explosions to plug most holes in cover, and force the melee enemies to run through a kill box, or risk getting a status effect. Exploration is mostly you running through buildings holding the shift key looking for stuff to steal. The world map is a bit like a honeycomb, and certain routes are cut off to you in the beginning through the use of radiation. It's a mechanism to protect the player from themselves, so while it restricts freeform movement, it opens up enough of the map at the start to allow players to feel a sense of freedom without getting them one-shot by high-level enemies. Gameplay consists of two phases, exploration and combat. Exploration takes on a similar structure to old-school Fallout games. You explore a new place, talk to new people, gather new quests, and search for a solution to those problems. Sometimes those problems are solved by combat, but sometimes it can be circumvented with a skill. Sometimes you can even short-circuit combat by sneaking past the enemy and doing, let's say, some mechanical work on a generator, which will disable the enemy turrets, then sneak in and get a sneak attack for massive damage while also gaining initiative over the enemy. They won't know what hit them. In exploration mode, chatting with NPCs has a more investigative feel. The personalities of your rangers rarely get a chance to show through, aside for the rare chances when you get to use your personality skills. You could be a kiss ass or a badass. It's a rather limited feeling mechanic carried over from previous titles. The dialogue feels utilitarian, which isn't a bad thing. My initial playthrough made me feel like it was mostly there for world building and to inform you of the motives and, and machinations of the denizens of Colorado. Who your character is, however, is defined by what they do. Which is an excellent trade-off, to be honest, because you have a great deal of freedom in how you deal with the various factions of Colorado. The structure of most quests that aren't solved by combat are usually structured like this. Solve the problem via a skill, choose the lesser of two evils, or be an asshole. There's a couple of quests that have no fourth option to solve most problems through a difficult task. If you can't solve the issue with a skill, someone's likely to die. The problem with that is that you could sometimes find yourself in a place where you're at the very end of a mission, and just moments away from leveling the very skill you need to progress and find your progress halted because you want to do something else, but you can't. You'll need to make a decision. 
Walk all the way back to the exit and grind out a level, then come all the way back for the desired result, or throw your hands up in frustration and sacrifice the better quest outcome to apathy. It's not all that bad though, as I've only run into that situation twice and it's because I slacked on leveling up a particular skill, explosives, because I wasn't really using it. If this structure does one thing, it inspires a ton of replay and it really makes you agonize over the decisions you're making. The pacing of Wasteland 3 starts off with a bang, with having your squad ambushed by some redneck named the Dorseys. There's a lot of them, and you'll get the feeling that their dating pool is more like a puddle. Howdy, Hotlander! But after the ambush, the game slows down a bit and gives you a chance to look at your new base. Evict some vermin from the various rooms. Of course. We'll go to the city then. Beg for food like the others do. And clear up the... mass graves that someone left in your office? Then you'll be able to explore Colorado Springs and the surrounding locales, and you'll likely stay here for a while. And this is when the loading screens will piss you right up a wall because this part of the game requires a lot of back and forth through zones, especially the apartment building. Mainly because you'll get the mission over the radio, go to the apartments and load in, find out that you don't have a high enough lock picking, leave, load up Colorado Springs, do another mission, which will most likely have you loading into another area, finish the mission, leave, load up Colorado Springs again, load up the apartments again, do the mission, get told to leave and find Irv in the market, come back, get your reward, and leave again to continue. That's like eight load screens. And that wouldn't be bad if they were quick, but even with an SSD, loading would take anywhere from half a minute or more. Like, I know I might be the only one that felt like this, but Colorado Springs made me entirely forget what the main mission was about. I got so wrapped up in the local intrigue that I forgot that I was there to kidnap a dictator's kids. The middle of the game, however, was great. I just ignored the main story because the level requirements for the next story mission was so far away from achievable at the moment that I was like, whatever, I'm gonna go sow discord in the great kingdom of Colorado a bit. The factions were mostly unique with a few old tropes like cannibals and cannibals and more cannibals. I especially like the monster army. And I know what you're probably thinking, right? Big mutant guys, right? Just running around with Gatling guns and pots and pans for armor, no. The Monster Army is a gang that found a bunch of old reel-to-reel -reel movies of the Wolfman and Dracula from the 50s, and a ton of old Halloween masks and said, We are the Monster Army, so now speak in vaguely Romanian accents. Breathy, very breathy. Margarete. The gang is led by a guy named Flab the Inhaler, because he's a big fat Dracula. There's nothing wrong with that, I just... I just wanted you to consider that for a moment, that someone in a room around a big conference table suggested that name, completely sober. No drugs, just dressed up in work clothes and maybe a sweater vest with a straight face. After hours of back and forth about different ideas, this man stood up triumphantly and said, we should call him Flab the Inhaler. The office rejoiced. Never before had they seen a man, nay, a king, nay, a sweater vest Adonis, quite like this man. And then everyone cheered him and carried him down the hallway in victory. And that would be the last time that he ever felt anything that fulfilling ever again. He couldn't even smile at the birth of his first son. Anyway, the whole game ends with you having to make a very difficult choice, which will have you asking yourself one of two things. Do I restart the game and try again? Or what did I do wrong? The ending follows an internal logic that I agree with while staunchly am opposed to. I won't go into it, suffice to say that some characters do things that I'm just like... What? Really? You chose to do that. Overall though, about 99% of this game's story is 100% awesome. The game world is just the right kind of wacky and crazy, and manages to push the post-apocalyptic genre a bit further into satire, which I think is the perfect genre for the post-apocalyptic setting. The game has some annoyances. The first little annoyance you'll notice is that your med packs keep getting unequipped when you have to heal more than one person. It's as if the ranger you were trying to heal keeps knocking the supplies out of your hand. I can't tell why this happens, but it only seems to happen when you hover your mouse over the item while it's being used, like if you're trying to queue up multiple heals at one time. Next, you might experience this animation lock where the character slides around the battlefield and doesn't animate even when attacking. 
This happened to two of my characters, and at the end of the game, and at least twice in other areas, it looked like it locked up and prevented my characters from attacking and doing damage, which is exactly what you want to happen at the end of your game. Then there's this bug that, while in combat, makes it so you cannot end combat. In fact, all of your inputs lock up and you can't move, spend AP, nothing. You're forced to reload a save and do the combat over again. So save often in between combat sections. I only encountered this bug about three times during one playthrough, but let me tell you, the three times was more than enough to make me have to walk away from the game and take a fucking beta blocker. There's another bug where if an NPC disappears for one reason or another from the combat field but isn't killed, the AI is unable to continue the combat round. They're just unable to end. They just stand there. Then there's little annoyances that I wouldn't exactly call bugs, but more like UX failures. For instance, Ambush. Ambush is like Overwatch and XCOM. You spend some AP to hold an attack until the enemy pops out of cover. Cost of an ambush scales to the AP cost of your melee attack, but not for perks for some reason. I don't know why. In this clip, notice that the AP cost of my power fist says two AP, but when I attack, it only uses one AP. That is because the perk doesn't update the UI. It also doesn't update the movement grid, which is why my character is constantly saying he doesn't have enough AP to do this, because he clearly does. The frustrations don't end there. If you have a perk that allows you to attack for free after reloading or after moving a certain distance, you have to make sure you have at least one AP left over, or your turn will auto end and you'll get screwed out of your free attack. It's frustrating because if you click fast enough, your character will actually start attacking even after their round is over, proving it was not meant to work this way. If we need to have at least one AP to do the action, just have the cost of the action be reduced by one AP in the perk description to avoid confusion in the player. I've also seen a bug. I don't know. I might have also hallucinated this, so just, you know call me out if I'm wrong here. If you have range reduced by a weapon mod, the line showing where you can shoot from show up incorrectly, and only after you move do you realize you can't shoot. I only experienced this twice during my playthrough, so it wasn't a huge hindrance, but I'm, like I said, I might have also hallucinated this problem, so take that with a grain of salt. So, a rating. Now, while I want to give this a Cures Cancer out of 10, it feels like it just misses that mark and is instead helping in search of a cure. The music in the game has this very rustic feeling to them. They're theme songs from movies or TV shows and old hymns and church songs that they all have an ominous air about them. Now, before you listen to this song, you need to clinch up real tight because these songs are going in raw. Your specially tailored group of rangers will feel like the baddest group to roam the wasteland by the end of the game, and the people of Colorado will react to that. While it may lack the seriousness of many newer titles, <laughs> it's not without something to say. In fact, this silly backdrop is an excellent rendition of the ridiculous spectacle that is politics, and shows that sometimes a bad thing done for a good reason is still evil and if you're a ranger, you won't trade your integrity for promises of supplies. I mean, I know how that sounds coming from me, someone who got the game for free, but, um, like, whatever, man. Love ya. Bye.